Unpacking Mormonism is a subsidiary of Daisy Girl Communications, LLC. All content herein is intended for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice or counsel of your personal care provider. All right. Well, I got to say, I'm happy to have my microphone back. (laughs) You didn't like (laughs) sharing with me? I did not like sharing. The plan, of course, is to get another microphone because we want to have other guests. But as of right now, we don't. So Sarah and I were sharing. Well, I'm actually recording with our first guest tomorrow. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I've got five more lined up that are coming on here in the near future a a microphone is coming so uh Uh, it does it does keep my comments to a minimum though i know i really (laughs) liked your silence and i didn't interrupt you anywhere near as often you liked my silence thank you for that Hello, and welcome to Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma. I am joined today by my co-host, Mason. Hi, everybody. And our 16-year-old son, Hayden Westbrook. Hey. It's going to be hard for our listeners to tell the difference between father and son because they sound so much alike. What? 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 (laughs) All righty. Who was who? Okay, so today we're going to talk about unhealthy relationship patterns. And this episode was inspired by our son Hayden. Um, A couple weeks ago, he came home from church. He'd gone to church with his dad and he came home and he had some thoughts that had occurred during Sunday school while they were talking about the story of Job. And so we invited him on today to come and talk to y'all so that way you could hear some of these thoughts that we get from our youth because our youth are incredibly intelligent and he's my son which makes him a freaking genius heck yeah (laughs) all righty so our intention for today is to explore the idea that bible stories when taken literally as actual events that happened may impact how we interact with each other's with each other in today's day and age. And I find it very interesting that we're taking a book that is very antiquated and archaic and the ideas and and whatnot that were influenced back in Bible days and utilizing those as more than just stories that could have spiritual significance, but that those events literally happened. And even that we then try and model our own relationships today off of some of those events. I feel like when we do that, we have a tendency to gloss over toxic patterns in order to extrapolate some spiritual significance in a small story. And so today I really wanted to be able to slow down the story of Job. Um, But first I wanted to let Hayden go ahead and tell you a little bit about what happened for him in Sunday school and what inspired our our episode today. So Hayden, take it away. Uh, So basically around, I think it was four weeks ago in church, uh, we were talking about Job and how um, his story, he um, was, uh, cut that, let me rephrase that. He was kind of stripped of everything he had as a bet that um, the devil had with the Lord where he said, um, your people aren't loyal to you and um, despite how they act or whatever, um that when taken uh when their things are taken away from them they will kind of lose faith in you which i thought was stupid because it felt like the lord was just making a bet and he already knew the outcome of or he's supposed to already know the outcome of how our lives are going to end or work so i thought it was stupid that the lord was able to just do that and um we're supposed to just believe in him kind of blindly, um, especially since it felt like Job had kind of worked for everything that he, um, everything that he had, like it said, he had fields and fields of cattle, uh, tons of lands, hundreds of servants, and all of this was kind of destroyed in a fire, and he held out despite the cruelty that the Lord had kind of displayed towards him. So I'm going to pause you for a minute, Hayden. What about the Lord and Jesus betting 
about, I'm sorry, the Lord and Jesus, the Lord and Satan, what about them betting on Job's life? Why did that make you so uncomfortable? Mostly that the Lord is supposed to be somebody that we can look up to and depend on. And if he's making bets with our life, it seemed just, I really hated that the Lord was able to do that and we're expected to still believe in him. And in church, our teacher was kind of just ignoring the fact that everything Job had um, kind of just went away because the devil and the Lord were betting on his life. Right. They were kind of playing a game with his entire life. Mason, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I agree. It kind of it kind of makes some trust issues, right? Like one of the big deals that we gain from just learning the gospel or in Mormonism or in Christianity in general is that we're meant to be able to trust God completely. And stories like this kind of really put a damper on that, that maybe that trust maybe that trust is misplaced and I know other people are going to have different interpretations of this story. And and I know there's lots of good lessons to be learned from this story. And I intend to talk about that a little bit more late later, but yeah, that was the kind of the big deal is that there, there's a damper in the trust that we're supposed to have in God. And, and I agree because it felt like, yeah, there's lessons to be learned. We need to hold on and be strong and that our possessions, our worldly possessions are not, our life, but it felt like the major issue with the whole story was being ignored to try and learn these lessons. And it just, it didn't feel real. Yeah. Well, and a lot of people are going to say, oh, it's the Old Testament. The Old Testament's totally effed up. What the heck? Why are we putting so much emphasis on this? But Hayden, I heard you say, you know, they were glossing over, they were missing the whole, like this huge massive toxic thing that I didn't like we were just glossing over that to get to the lesson do you think you can say a little bit more about about that um so I don't know how to word this but basically the teacher was the teacher was kind of um, he was mostly so we went through the we went through the scriptures we went through come follow me we did all this talking um and i hadn't i had did not read the story of job and the scriptures i have a hard time reading the scriptures um but we'd read the story or portions of the story of job and how he had all this stuff and how he was just miserable without it because obviously everything all of his money all all his whole family had been killed in the fire and towards the end of the the story of Job, it was like his family and everything was replaced, but you can't really replace a family and what you have, especially the bonds that you could have made with them. And although he may have, God may have quote unquote rewarded Job in the end, there's still that trauma. There's still everything that Job had worked for was gone. And yeah. probably PTSD from how he had had to have lived um, during his poverty. Well, and not just living through poverty, but losing his entire family. Yeah. And I think it was a windstorm, like the way I think if memory serves me correctly, the way the Bible said it was, you know, a strong wind came and the whole family died because the house fell down on them. Yeah. So for me, I'm like, whoa, basically he lost his entire family in one fell swoop in a tornado. And yeah, Hayden, I agree with you. It's kind of bothersome to think, oh, well, he lost his seven sons and three daughters in a tornado, but no big deal. God gave him seven more sons and three more daughters, and his daughters were super hot. Yeah. Um, because that's important. You know, his daughters were even more beautiful than the last ones, and we're just going to ignore all of these lost relationships and the trauma, and we're going to kind of silence that. Did you bring that up with your with your teachers? Were you able to say, hey, I think the story's kind of messed up? I didn't feel like my voice would have been heard. Um Recently, with you leaving the church, there's a lot of people who just really... It's not that they don't like you, it's that they don't necessarily feel comfortable around you, and it felt like that was... Um, that kind of behavior was also put on me. So while... Apostate. Apostate? Yeah, I'm an apostate because I left the church and I'm speaking oh. out against it, so dad's yes. just teasing. So, <laughs> because mom's an apostate... <laughs> A lot of people were not are not necessarily a fan of you, and 
it kind of felt like that was passed back through me and I didn't feel like my voice would have been heard because there was the teacher and there was um, basically his assistant and they were both rambling about how Job's story was inspirational, how he could be faithful through all of this. And I was like, there's a lot of problems with this story, but I don't feel like my voice will be heard. And even if it is heard, I don't feel like it's going to be something that's impactful than everybody in the room. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that's been really hard for the family is to see how the entire family is being treated differently since I left the church. Hayden, you're nodding your head there. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I just, it's, I used to enjoy going to the church and for some of it, I still do. Like I still like going to the sacrament and maybe I don't believe that it's like a form of repentance or whatever, but it feels like that to somebody else and actually a lot of people and it's kind of a blessing to be able to give that to people. But the overall stares and just, I feel like a lot of people don't like me as much as they used to. And then all the people who were kind of grown up, like I had a bunch of friends who were priests and stuff um, who were way more open-minded and everything. They're all gone. They've all moved out. Um, so the church just feels more hostile to go to. Feels hostile? Mm-hmm. See, and I, one of the things that I absolutely love about you is, is you can say, you know, the sacrament may not have the same meaning to me as it does to these other people, but I'm happy to help with a ritual that brings other people peace. And then the way that I interpret what you're explaining is that people kind of view you as dangerous or tainted because your mom might be putting ideas into yeah. your head that aren't good and they want to make sure that their lessons stay pure. Is that an accurate assessment or am I totally putting inaccurate words in your mouth here? Yeah, that that sounds about right. Um, it felt like everybody there was kind of, I don't want to say brainwashed because they're probably, like I feel like brainwashed really isn't the right word, but I feel like closed-minded was a better word because these are the teachings of the church. This is how it should be done. This is what they mean rather than, there could be some separate meanings. There could be some, like, there could be some thoughts or lessons or actions from the scriptures or the church that aren't just, that we want to avoid. It felt like there's kind of the idea of um, impure things in the church isn't possible when there we're literally people in general are imperfect and impure and it's going to happen yeah you know it's funny in the church i feel like we're taught you know people talk all the time about how they read a scripture and then they'll read that scripture again, you know, a few months, a few years later, and they learn something entirely new. Or President Nelson, uh, Russell M. Nelson, made a big deal about reading through the Book of Mormon again when Thomas S. Monson said, hey, everybody read the Book of Mormon again, and all the things that he paid attention to and learned. And, you know, we expect to learn new things. It's like the norm for us to learn new things each time we go through the scriptures. <laughs> But they all still have to fall in line with the same thing. Like, there's no branching out. There's no, wow, this is an entirely new perspective I'd never even thought of before. It's maybe not even really gospel-related. It's just a new perspective, and there's not a whole lot of room for that. Yeah, Mace, I think that's a really good point. And the other thing that, that I you know think a lot is we can look at this and we can say, okay, Job stayed faithful to something that he held near and dear, and whatnot, but we kind of gloss over the, hey, this is kind of a messed up story. I mean, I agree with you, Hayden. When you talk about Jesus and Satan or the Lord and Satan making a bet over Job's life to see if Job will worship the Lord through all of these trials, what what I see is this strong parallel for toxic parenting in the sense of two parents who are utilizing their children as pawns to pick their favorite parent. And I think, Mason, that's something that you and I are going to really kind of dig into because I think the scriptures can be a huge lesson in what not to do just as much as there, you know, there's, there's some spiritual significance. For me personally, I take the scriptures more to be symbolic stories where 
you know, and, and, and needing to place them in the time frame or the, the time period that the, those stories were told and understanding the context of those stories at that time. Because Hayden, one of the things that you're talking about is he gets more kids and, you know, all of these other things as if his children are belongings rather than human connections and relationships. And so there's a lot of really skewed stuff. And and I know, again, I want to say that there's a lot of people out there that are like, ah, oh, it's the Old Testament. There's a whole bunch of crazy stuff in the Old Testament. And yet when we look at some of the patterns of behavior and the way that the patriarchy in the church is structured, we kind of still see that that undertone, that undercurrent of toxicity within relationships between those who are the leaders or our relationship with God in this sense and us as humans. And I think that that's really hard because there isn't a lot of room to question inside the Mormon church. So Hayden, what about before I left the church? Do you think you would have been comfortable talking about this in that class prior to me formally leaving the church? I don't really know if it would have came to mind because as as you've left the church and all these new ideas of like Joseph Smith not being who he says he was, all these people having a lot of dark sides to them, it never really occurred to me. I feel like the prophet wasn't was like chosen, literally chosen by the Lord. Um, and maybe that's still true and they're probably, I still believe that there is a savior or Jesus or whatever. I just feel like that religion, the perfect religion, the perfect whatever can't come into the world right now or anytime because people are imperfect. Um, but no, I don't really feel like I would have been able to express that mostly because it wouldn't have come to mind, okay. which is what kind of makes me say that Mormons to a sense are brainwashed or, Closed-minded. Yeah, I think one of the words you're looking for, it's called indoctrinated. Indoctrinated, it sounds Where good. we're taught these things and we're taught not to question. And therefore, those types of questions, you know, we, we, we get uncomfortable with critical thinking inside those high-demand religions because it goes against the curriculum. And we've been taught for so long you have to stick with this curriculum. So Hayden, I had asked you to prepare, you know, a couple of questions or something um, to talk about today. Do you want to share some of those that you wrote up? Um, one of them had to do something with like worshiping God through everything we do, um, because it felt like Job was still worshiping God, even though everything he had worked for was gone. Um, and I well, see it. And all I think the it's weird because. He was worshiping the person who was taking it away from him, almost exactly. like he was worshiping his abuser. Yes. It's kind of a what we call, in, in my field, something we call very narcissistic. Yes. And, and manipulative. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Keep going. Um, so it felt like, or let me rephrase that, it was, if I'm given, like I, I want to say that I'm very talented. I play uh, three instruments. I wrestle. I do theater and I sing. Um, and all of these are great, and I love it, and I've worked so hard to get them. Um, and although God may have given me the ability to learn them, he didn't teach me how to. He didn't go through the struggle to learn and become good at them. Um, and if he was to take those away, I would I would be incredibly um, mad at him because it just doesn't feel... It doesn't feel okay because everything I've worked for is now gone. Right. Um, so simply what, as a bet against my life and my faith. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, you, you, can, you say that you feel like God may have given you the opportunity to develop these talents. You may even believe that people were put into your path to, to teach you and instruct you. But you feel like when God starts playing games with your life in a bet, that it erases the effort and the pain and the love that you have simply to glorify God, as if your efforts are meaningless. Yes. Yeah, that's really difficult. It also, another one of the things I'd kind of written down was how... Hold on just oh. a second. So Go I have ahead. a thought about that one because um, there's a verse in Mosiah in the Book of Mormon. It's Mosiah chapter 2, verse 21, where King Benjamin is teaching the people. And he says, basically, because I don't want to quote the whole thing, but it's Mosiah chapter 2, verse 21, that if you spent your whole lives 
in service to God and doing everything that you could do, you would still be unprofitable servants. And I used to find comfort in that because the the lead-in then is how much we need the atonement in our lives and how much we need the sacrifice that the Savior made. And I, I think I still agree with all of that, but we spent a lot of time in this podcast talking about messages that weren't intended but are still received. And this idea that I could spend my whole life working as hard as I can and still be unprofitable. Basically, it's, it's he's saying that I, I'm, I'm not worth the effort to the Savior. And I don't like that idea. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's true. But that is one of the messages that we're, that we're given. And so in your case, you're talking about all the efforts that you put into improving talents that you were given. If you believe that God gives talents, then you were given these talents, but they still require development, and you put an awful lot of effort into those developments. And so if God were just to you know, have a bad day, basically, and say, okay, Hayden can't sing anymore, no more instruments, and he's weak, he can't wrestle. And a tornado is going to come through Missouri, and his whole family is going to die in one second. Yeah, and cut. Co- yeah. Coming off of that is the other question I'd written down where it felt like the stories of the Bible and the Book of Mormon were taken so literally and they felt it felt like everybody was thinking these are nonfiction and maybe there's some truth, but there's definitely as we translate, like obviously the Bible or whatever wasn't written in English to start. It wasn't written in the languages we have today, and I feel like maybe there was some truth and it's nonfiction very very distantly like maybe somebody or like folk tales or something where there's a little teeny piece of truth yeah like maybe a guy lost his whole family in a tornado and he still kept the faith in his god yeah or he just kept working hard to do the things that he loved or whatever but it felt like or it feels like they're taken so literally and treated as not just a story but as reality um I think just in a literal sense, there's no way that it's come. I don't know when this, when the time frame of Job's story was, but thousands of years and stayed the exact same. And even just when it was written, there's not multiple, multiple perspectives being put into the story. So it's the side of one person writing the story. And I feel like there's just so much that's, being missed in the story of Job and it's still being treated as fact. It's almost like Greek mythology or a Greek tragedy, except it has kind of a morbid happy ending and God replaced his family and he lived happily ever after as if nothing bad ever happened to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think some of the issue there is that, you know, in Christianity, we believe in an infallible God. Like he doesn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether or not you agree with that, that's not really the question here. But my point is that because people believe that they look at a story like this and then they just struggle to make sense of it. Well, God couldn't have made the mistake. So what's going on here? How do we understand this? Whereas like what Sarah said earlier is that if you take a look at it and go, this looks like an unhealthy relationship. And that's what we're going to talk about mostly here in, in a few minutes. Um, you try to understand then, and maybe there were other lessons there. Not, you know, the lesson here isn't that God is infallible. The lesson here is that people with power and trust can um, take advantage of you, can hurt you in ways that you might not be able to recover from. And, and who knows? I'm just making conjecture, conjecture here. But there's lots of different things that could or might be learned from that situation. Yeah, well, and it's also really interesting because, you know, depending on who's talking or who's teaching a lesson, sometimes we're taught in Mormonism that God gives us trials so that we can learn and grow. And then other times we're taught that Satan's the one that's giving us trials and making life difficult. How the heck are you supposed to know? And, you know, when I'm raising my children, I'm not purposefully making their lives miserable so that they can honor and respect me that's kind of emotionally abusive that's not kind of emotionally abusive that's just straight up 
emotionally abusive, nor do I want to, you know, bet with my husband, you know, which, which one of us is going to be the kid's favorite. Rather, I want you to have that healthy respect. And so, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of really unhealthy relationship dynamics going on here. And most of us would be able to listen to this and say, okay, well, you know, Jesus and Satan aren't in a relationship, except that in Mormonism, they're brothers. Yeah. So basically, this is like big brothers betting against all of their younger siblings in a really effed up manner. Yeah, like it, I don't, might not be the best analogy, but if like Eric and I were to bet our, um, we were able to bet on the kids, like take all their stuff and see which one's going to be able to entertain themselves the longest. It's just, it's not, it doesn't feel like it accomplishes anything um, in a sense. Right, and going back to what Dad said, so if you and Eric bullied the little kids, made a bet over their lives, made everything miserable on purpose to see which brother they liked the best, what would their relationship be like with either one of you? Or how long they would last, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and that's kind of what happens here in Job is, well, how long is he going to last? You know, how long yeah. are we going to push this out? There's no real timeline in the story, but it, it seems like it goes on for a while. And so, yeah, that's just... Yeah, almost like let's push Landon until he has a nervous breakdown and then let's give him a bunch of cookies and ice cream and video game time so that he doesn't tell mom on us because nobody wants <laughs> hate in your face. Nobody yeah. wants the wrath of mama once she finds out that we just bullied <laughs> one of the little ones yeah, into yeah. submission. And that's, that's really what I feel like is going on in this story is that in a way the Lord and Satan bullied Job in a manner that's super unhealthy that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Well, and I hadn't, hadn't really thought about this, that I like that idea there, you know, in this case, Job survives the test, right? Yes. But I have a, I find it hard to believe that his wife wasn't just as faithful and she didn't survive the test at all. Mm -hmm. Like she really struggled. She had a hard time with this whole thing going on and and fell apart pretty quickly. And we don't hear anything about her story, of course. Um we don't know anything about her because the story is all about Job and and that's part of my issue too is that it's all about this bet and the way that Job <laughs> handles things and there's no thought whatsoever into most of the other characters. Right, collateral damage. Yeah. Who yeah. else got hurt? Yeah. Hey, and, go ahead. And again, this just, it didn't feel like it could be shared or discussed or like there's a bad thing in this lesson, but how do we continue to learn through this rather than just ignoring it? We rather, we acknowledge the issues so that we're more open-minded and become overall have a better mindset and become better people, which I feel like overall is the goal that Sunday school wants to prepare you for scouts, all that. They want to prepare you to be good people once once they don't have leaders like my scout leader or whatever to, um, to help guide and create an environment that's good. So the question would be, how do we create that environment where I can question and I can discuss and all of this without feeling Where your voice can be heard. Yes. And where your opinions, even if they're different, are valued. And where no matter how crazy your mama is... <laughs> that you can still be honored as an individual person with thoughts and opinions of value. Because while you've definitely been heavily influenced by your father and I, because that's a normal dynamic yes. as we've raised you, you're 16 now and you're really starting to branch out and gain your own ideas and your own identity separate from us, which is what you're supposed to do, even if it makes me cry sometimes. <laughs> Stop growing up. You're my baby. But... That's that's what you're supposed to do. And so to feel like your opinion is dangerous because your mother has been identified as an apostate, that's that's a difficult thing. Well, and there's an irony here too, right? If the church and the church leaders are concerned about Hayden as a person, so if I think about me as a teacher, I want you to share your crazy ideas. Yeah. I want those to come out because that's the only way I can know what's going on in your mind and the only way I have any impact 
on those things. Like, say you say something crazy, you're completely wrong. That's how I know. Now I can learn. And now we can, we can talk about it. Okay, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Can we, let's talk about, you know, why that's not quite what was meant or whatever. And then we help to direct you and guide you. But so many people in the church, and, and of course, this is not exclusive. There's lots of people not like this. But a lot of people in the church are afraid of any kind of idea that doesn't fall in line with what they believe. And I feel like, for me, the bishop, we have a very good bishop. who We do. To me, really is good about having a growth and open mindset. And he's somebody I look up to. He's very, like, he's very steadfast um, with the church, but he's also open-minded. He also sees the issues, and he's still able to learn from the story of Job or whatever stories he's reading, and it, it's something that I strive to be like, but right now I'm having an issue with um, other people not having that kind of mindset. Well, and I think, you know, you guys talk about this being something inside the church, and I just kind of want to echo, Mason, something that you started to say, and I just kind of want to drive that point home. This is not an issue exclusive inside Mormonism. Um, Adults being in a position where they silence children's voices because of differing ideas or opinions, that's, that's an epidemic. That's a problem in society today. You know, you see these these generations calling our, our younger kiddos snowflakes because they're more in touch with their emotions or the millennials are ruining our future for us. And I'm sitting here going, these millennials are incredibly intelligent in a very different way that I was. And so if we can hold space for, hey, they might be doing it differently or they might be thinking about this differently, but we stop and we listen and we work to connect with those people those, these individuals, these younger generations, we're really nurturing our future for a better tomorrow. And I mean, that that almost sounds really idealistic. It sounds like it came from a movie. I know, right? But I, I believe it. I believe that if we as parents can connect with our children on a deeper emotional level, level and if we can be as as adults as leaders as mentors be a place where our children can disagree and challenge the way that I think about things and have that be safe and valued and heard and honored as an entire society we grow and we become something different and you know I I my heart goes out to you Hayden um, I'm really proud of you because th- things in our home, they haven't been easy. I don't. I wouldn't say that they've been, your, your dad keeps saying struggle, struggle, struggle. And, and I wouldn't say that all of the kids are constantly in a state of struggle, yeah. but all of you are looking at this church environment that has been a staple of your lives. It's It's different now. And I really admire your willingness to continue to go back because you find value and meaning there. I think that that's important and wonderful and I also love and I'm super proud of you for being able to kind of take that as a nuanced and as as a critical thinker to kind of look at this story and go wait a minute that relationship seems a little bit messed up but also to maybe find the value and the good in there as well I think that's a really healthy place for you to be and at 16 I can just say you make your mama really proud thank you All right, so we want to move right along. There's whoa, a couple whoa, whoa, whoa. of things. I'm really proud oh, I'm of sorry. Hayden. What did you oh, think? Oh, absolutely, of... yeah. I mean, so very well spoken. That's my kid, y'all. <laughs> I remember when he came to uh, to you or to me. I actually, I think actually he told me on the way home from church. I'd asked him, so right. I was church, and he told me about some of this, and I was like, oh yeah, I mean that makes sense, and I don't like the idea that voices are shut down. I kind of understand why it happens, right. but I don't agree with with why it happens. And I actually had a similar thing happen to me with one of the um, one of the leaders in our ward. It, I was teaching young men's and mm-hmm. kind of just uh, like accused me of teaching false doctrine, and uh, and it was it was an interesting experience. And so I don't like the idea that my kids yeah. feel shut down. Some of the some of the parents were a little concerned that Brother Westbrook and Brother John Doe had <laughs> argued a little bit about yeah. doctrine in front of their in front of their kiddos, which again I I'm gonna echo Hayden's concerns. 
the dynamic of being trusted and valued yeah. for all of you has unfortunately yeah. changed as I've stepped away, which I absolutely hate. That yeah. it just makes me absolutely sick. Yeah, that that's going on, and well, that that's a dynamic that our children, because Eric or not Eric, Hayden's not the only one who has right. So that, and you're right. So what happened was I was in Arizona. That was the weekend that I was in Arizona, and then California, because Eric had graduated from college. So I mm-hmm. went with him and and kidnapped him, and we went to California and and Did you played. Say kidnapped? I, Facebook well, would put you he's under an adult. House I adult napped him because <laughs> yeah, no. And I he and I went on a little mini vacation, just he and I to kind of celebrate right. that he had graduated from college. And Hayden called and said, Mom, I really have something I want to talk to you about. And he went through this. And then he also talked about that video that we then watched. And we said, OK, I think some of his opinion on that video was influenced by where he was already thinking, but about this kid that had been severely injured and the solution was to bring him a big picture of Jesus and maybe Mm -hmm. some cookies, but that's not actually helpful for healing. And that's not super connective, almost like, Hey, you had this really bad thing. Well, here's Jesus. Jesus will comfort you rather than me sitting with you and comforting you. And so, yeah, we really talked about that and, I'm just really good proud conversation. of him. I'm proud of him too. Yeah, yeah I'm really proud of him. Do that. Because he's found he demonst- his voice. He's found his voice with those kinds of things, partly because you have found your voice with Aww. those kind of things. And it it can be a struggle for me because mm-hmm. some of the things that he says I don't really want to hear. <laughs> uh, and some of the things he says, I'm struggling with too. So I want him to be able to speak. And and I meant what I said before. Like, if you can't speak up in a class in church, how do you know when somebody is hurting and when they're struggling? And, right. you know, if all we can talk about is the straight line stuff, it's got to be on the straight and narrow path. And that's all. Right. It has to fit within the prescribed you're, yeah, formula that we told you is okay. Yeah, yeah, you're missing the opportunity to teach that kid or, or that adult or whoever. Well, sometimes it's not the environment. You know, sometimes it's not the teacher's fault or, or oh, whatnot. Absolutely. But there's there's been untrained some other... Untrained teachers, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Untrained teachers, untrained yeah. professionals. Yeah. You know, yeah, this is, it's going to happen anywhere. Right. This but, isn't a criticism on those people. Although some of them could do better, it's mostly just... Right hey, this is something we can do better, so let's figure out a way to. Yeah, well, and I was, I think the thing that impressed me the most about that conversation when Hayden came to me was that he recognized the unhealthy relationship pattern Mm, of he lost his family, and it's like that didn't even matter like there right. was no pain Doesn't like really come up <laughs> where's that connection and then the other piece was just that that level of empathy and I think yeah. one of the things that we need to add is there have been many leaders in his life within the Mormon church where he would have had no issues saying hey I think this is really messed up let's talk about this yeah. and I'm, I'm really glad that he said you know our bishop is one of those people that you yeah. can trust because I agree with I agree with Hayden if if we had a different bishop I'm not sure Hayden would go to church but Hayden yeah. really looks up to our bishop and and our bishop does seem to be a very understanding and yeah. open-minded He's a good individual man for sure. yeah. yeah which I'm very grateful for but one of the reasons why Hayden didn't feel like he could speak up in this specific class is because he's had some run-ins with these with these teachers and one of the things that he and I talked about was you know, reading the room. And so when he called me and was like, mom, I just kind of need to vent. And, you know, we yeah. talked about it and validated his feelings and whatnot. I was able to tell him, you know, Hayden, I'm really proud of you because sometimes you have to read the room and recognize my opinion is not going to be valued in this environment and trying to be heard in this case isn't going to get me anywhere. Yeah. It's just going to get a lot of contention and and cause more harm than good. And so that's, yeah, I was very, very very proud of him very for that. Very valuable lesson for for anyone is to learn to recognize and, and read the room, right? Sometimes yeah. you're gonna be able to speak up and there's gonna be a lot of good that comes from what you have to say and other times you're gonna speak up and yeah. there's not gonna be a lot of good. So yeah, yeah. that's good. Really really proud of him. All right, so Mason, All right. let's break down some of this job crap. <laughs> So I want to start simply by saying, it's funny, there was a thought uh, that was something you were just saying is that uh, as I went through Job, because I read through a lot of it, I I did not read through all of it, but I read through a lot of it. And my recollections are, I don't think that Job talks about his children 
at all. I know. Like, Isn't the that creepy? Whole story. There's lots of talk about where he is. There's lots of talk about being faithful to God and his, whatever his call is in this. No talk about his children. And so we're going to go through some of this because like you said, we're talking about unhealthy relationships. I wanted to start by saying, look, there are good lessons in any story. In this case, we're talking about Job. There's lots of good lessons to be gleaned from Job. And I know a lot of people do that. I know a lot of people gain some comfort from this. And that's great, right? I'm I'm not saying that um, there aren't satisfactory answers to the questions being asked. Because there probably are. But we have focused on in this podcast not so much the intended message but the other messages that are being shared. And that's kind of where we're headed today is what are some of the other messages that are getting picked up? And then finally, uh, actually, that's exactly what I was going to say. There's there's less obvious but toxic messages that are in this story and that we're going to go over today. Well, and I think one of the things that's unique to this story is there's a lot of toxic. And again, leave it to the Old Testament to give us some really (laughs) wacky stuff that we can examine all day. But how we interpret this and the fact that we're glossing over the weird stuff and we're not talking about it kind of lends itself to this must be acceptable because it's the Lord. Like we're talking about the Lord utilizing Job as a pawn a little bit. And that's, yeah. 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 You have to be able to acknowledge the contradiction. You have to be able to acknowledge the toxic. You have to be able to acknowledge the fact that this conversation that goes down between God and Satan has some really unhealthy pieces to it. That doesn't mean you have to then go, well, can't, it, can't, it must not be true, right? That's not what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to be able to look at this and go, let's acknowledge these right. things that exist here. We're not making these up. They exist here. And from your perspective as a counselor, you want to be able to share those things. So. Absolutely. Well, and it would be really interesting to get a Bible scholar to kind of explain what's going on because some of what the the dynamic that I'm seeing is if I'm looking at this from an anthropological standpoint, there were probably some really interesting beliefs about how the higher power, you know, God or the great spirit, or I say the great spirit, that's probably super rude to our native American brothers and sisters because I don't understand that context there. But that higher power that we look to anthropologically speaking, I'm sure there are some really strong archaic leanings in this story and i just find it really interesting that today in 2022 we're still leaning into these things despite the obvious holes yeah, <laughs> yeah yes. like the the first thing we don't even know where the the story of job actually fits into history right it's a story that's put into the bible right. and we have we don't know anything about okay. job at all except for what's in this story so yeah, somebody once compared me to Job. They said, ah, Sarah's Sarah's like Job, patient in her afflictions and always looking to the Lord. And I remember saying, well, that sucks. I think they, <laughs> I think they said it shortly after we lost our twins. Mm. Somebody told me that I had the patience of Job. And I would say at that moment in time when we lost our t- twins, I don't think I've ever been more angry at God at God in my life than I was when we lost those twins. And I was like, oh, (laughs) I'm not going to have a whole lot of patience. He and I are going to have, he's getting a butt chewing from Sarah. I'm going to cuss (laughs) at him tonight. And I did for several months, years. I mean, even, even into when we adopted Abigail, I remember our, our home stay. Well, and I actually just realized this. I had a client the other day, tell me that they had been listening to this lady, a podcast that I've got to go look into now that was done by Robin Gobble about um, parenting and neuroscience with parenting. And I, I just looked it up for a minute. Robin is the one that did yeah. our home study in Texas in yeah. for, for our adoption in Arizona. And she would have seen me in that frantic PTSD state 
where we had lost the adoption with the twins. Here we are, what, like a little over a year later when Abigail, yeah, August. Yeah, it was a little over a year later. And I was still grieving the loss of the twins when Abby was placed with us. And, you know, I just remember like being clinging like I was so afraid that somebody was going to take another baby from me and I couldn't do anything about it because when you adopt a child the child is not legally yours until the adoption is finalized which is usually six months after the baby is born if it's a newborn baby in a uh, so ours was a uh, private adoption yeah, it wasn't through the foster system. And I remember being a little crazy and then terrified because like in my head, I was like, I know that I'm acting unhealthy. I know that Robin is seeing this. And she, I think Robin had to tell me a couple times, I have no intentions of interrupting your adoption, but I think you need to go get some help. And I, and I ended up doing that. And that's when yeah. I met um, the character in my book, who is Dr. LM, who helped me work through EMDR with PTSD. You, I remember you being more intense, a lot oh, more that intense, was, and for an extended period of time. That was different right. for you, and I remember that. And bringing that back to our story of Job, you know, I'm going to echo what Hayden said. The fact that that Job doesn't mention his children, and in the the end of the story is he gets seven more sons and three more yeah. extra hot ladies for daughters, which is creepy. But <laughs> just the fact that it's like, oh, they just got replaced. I mean, I was terrified that somebody was going to take Abby because of what had happened with the twins, um, which is something we'll probably need to, you know, we keep referring to this, something that we'll have to tell that story sometime. But getting Abby did not eliminate my grief. For the twins. And every August and every New Year's, I grieve hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I cannot imagine, you know, in this story of Job, we talk about these unhealthy relationships. In a bet, God takes his entire family and then Job is just supposed to worship him. I just can't see that happening. I mean, I harbor a great deal of anger and resentment still for that judge who was also traumatized by the situation sure. and his inability to act to protect our babies. Yeah. Like, so, oh. yeah. So, so let's jump into the story here and talk about the unhealthy relationships. You brought up three. <clears throat> And so I just kind of want to go with those because you you have, once you mentioned them, they made perfect sense to me. And so let's kind of roll with them. The go first one. I'm going to let you kind of take over. <laughs> no, well, we'll see how this goes. It may for, never for happen like again. For like two seconds. Okay, hang on. I'm going to time <laughs> I'm it. I'm going to take over it. until Sarah interrupts me again. All right. So the first one is the relationship <laughs> between God and Satan. Right. So we have this. If you're not familiar with Job, I'm going to go over some of the basics of the story but not too much in detail. I kind of went through the whole story again, so I would have my details straight, but I'm not going to go through a lot of that today. So God or Satan comes to God and says, and God says, where have you been? And he says, oh, I've been everywhere roaming about. And and God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a perfect, he's an upright man. And basically, no one loves me or worships me the same way that he does. Yeah, see, and I, and I got us because that's so. Well, that was number, about twelve seconds. Uh, you know, I just, I didn't time it. <laughs> I turned it on to time it, and then I totally didn't time it. <laughs> um, no, it's so that's what's well, really no weird evidence. to me is we don't if want evidence. if Satan is here to harm your children, why the heck are you exposing right. your 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 children or your siblings? You know, in this case, the way that Mormons look at it is you have God, and we keep saying God and then the Lord. I think in this story, it's supposed to be Jesus, the Lord, but... It does say the Lord, so it's not so, specific okay, about so, who that is. For a lot of Christianity, that's the same person, so I right. think it's Right, and in just Mormonism, kind of it's that different. That's the case. But so, so if you're taking this from a Mormon view, and that's the Lord Jehovah, then from that doctrine they're brothers and if you're taking it from general christianity that's the father but either way if you know somebody is dangerous for your children 
why are you hanging out and being like, hey, look at look at this, you know, person. And I think with all the cases of child abuse and sexual abuse that are coming out in the church right now that are coming to light and the the BSA, we have a problem with that. You know, I actually just had a friend who's been a good friend forever talk about how the her father-in-law sent a missionary out on a mission knowing that he had had a history he went out mm. on the mission offended came home they said he repented then they made him you know in leadership again and he offended again and now he's serving time in prison and i'm just sitting here kind of going huh this is a common theme hey satan you yeah. dangerous evil person who are supposed to harm my children Let's what do you, what do you chance, think? Right? Let, let me show you, you my most perfect specimen. Because the way that the Lord talks about it, it's either his favorite kid or his favorite brother. It's like, right. look at Job. He's almost perfect. Right. Why don't you take a shot at him? And that's <laughs> nuts. So I, I, this is kind of my thought here. In, um, in verses, so we're in chapter 1, in verses 9 and 10, Satan's answer to God is, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him? So basically accuses God. Well, of course he fears you. You put a hedge around him. You protected everything that he has. Right. He's the spoiled one. So he's kind of goading God, which is like, uh, I guess if you don't know what goading baiting means. Him. Baiting him. Okay, that's, that's yeah. a good word. It's, he's it's baiting like him, a bacon, right? bait and hook, yeah. So, so then my thought was either Satan was wrong and God was goaded, like he was baited by Satan. God hasn't put a hedge around him, but he's been baited by Satan. Or uh, Satan was right, and God is a respecter of persons, neither of which is supposed to be possible right. in the God that we we see in Scripture. Right. He's supposed to be perfect. So Right. So which, you put it because out. Because you think he's perfect, therefore we're going to excuse... All of his bullshit. Right, right. And, and that's so two, so two things here. The first one is we have a habit of, and, and I think this is not specific to Mormonism. I think this is Christian. One of the things I love about this story is now we're in the Bible, right? This is a Christian right. story. Um, so we're dealing with some toxicity that just happens in Christianity in general, is that we spend so much time saying, well, God couldn't be the bad guy here, so how do we make this work for us? Right. And that's a real struggle. And, and we're not going to get into that one too much today. But that, that's kind of that thought there. Like we spend so much time trying to rationalize stories that don't make sense that we kind of maybe end up in some bad situations where we don't notice the real problems. So the second yeah. piece is what you brought out was this is kind of like, and I think you mentioned it for with Hayden when he was here too, this is kind of like a divorced parent relationship here. Right, so right. God and Jesus, or uh, Satan and Jesus, fighting over the kids, and right. and eventually they they essentially make a bet. And what what really kills me here is that it's not that he makes a bet necessarily about Job's stuff, but he makes a bet that eventually affects Job's family, and that's really what bothers me. Like he said, so all this bad stuff happens. All of his stuff is gone. There's a, and then, of course, his children are killed. And he gets all of these messages in rapid fire. Everything happens all at once. And once that happens, he's, he's sad. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the problem that I have with that is there is no grieving. There's no room for it. And I think the reason is... He's too afraid to sin. He's too afraid that something he might say in his grieving process is going to put him, going to put him at odds with God. And right. I just don't think that that's healthy. Not that I want to be at odds with God. I'm not saying, let's go out and just curse God. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're so scared that anything you do is going to put you at odds with God, that's trauma. Well, yeah, and... What you're describing in this situation, and, and one of the, the second thing that I brought up, is that in this story, God kind of comes off as having narcissistic personality disorder. Now, having said that, I want to make sure that I clarify, usually individuals on the personality spectrum have significant unresolved trauma 
in their lives. And right. so I want to be really careful with that label because right now narcissism is super trendy and we're kind of <laughs> tacking it on to everything. And so we really need to be cautious with that. But in this case, this is, I mean, I could pull out the DSM and, and the Lord or God in this case is absolutely going to fit that diagnostic criteria because, and, and Job very much responding as a victim of being in a relationship with somebody who's narcissistic. Right. I'm so afraid right. I'm going to mess up. You know, later in the story, you know, when God comes down and talks to Job and Job's kind of like, what the heck? The Lord's like, why are you complaining? I can c control the weather. I'm amazing. I have yeah. all this power. What's the matter with you? Right. But that, that paralyzing yeah. of, I can't, I can't feel my feelings because if I start feeling, that's going to be one more tool my abuser uses. But then again, coming back to that idea of I'm so in this story, the Lord is causing this pain on purpose in order to win a bet. And Job is afraid of and angering him. He's constantly repenting and, and coming back to God like, okay, what else can I do? And I'm, I'm going to ignore my emotions and I'm going to completely disconnect and be isolated from all my other relationships. Even my friends come in. My friends come in and my friends do some awesome things. But as soon as my friends begin to question my abuser, out the friends go. Like right. there are some serious patterns of abuse right. in this story. And I know that it's really hard for people to hear – Absolutely. That, you're talking hey, about God, right? Yeah. You're, well, you're... and I had a friend where I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking Russell M. Nelson might absolutely be on that narcissistic personality spectrum right. somewhere. There's there's just some things that he said or done that really tickle my counselor diagnostics. And of course, I don't know it for sure because I've never sat in the same room sure. with him. But there's definitely some patterns here. And and we've actually, I think we've talked about narcissism quite a bit in the seven or eight episodes that we've done so far. I think it's come up. It's come up a, a couple, couple times. of times. I don't feel like we've talked about it a lot, but it's come up a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we probably need to do a, a full episode on how to identify narcissistic tendencies from narcissistic personality disorder, and then also talk about what leads to those types of disorders speak and again it, it stems from trauma but what message are we sending to our patriarchy and our leadership with stories like these of as long as i'm doing it quote unquote god's way there don't ask okay. me any questions yeah. and you should not be should and i'm using that word on yeah. purpose here you shouldn't feel bad about it because your hand or your life is in God's hands and he's allowed to throw you around and do whatever the heck he wants with you. And to top it all off, if you just submit to it, you're going to get this huge mansion at some future undefined point in your existence, but it's not anything substantial that you can see. I mean, it's almost like if I compare that again, coming back to parenting, for me to tell my kids, which this is totally toxic, if I tell my kids, you better not hit your brother again or else something really bad is going to happen. Right. That is not a healthy way to manage challenging behavior with children. You need that predictable thing. Nobody can see this mansion. Like there's no way to solidify that this is even going on, you know, like there's that there's actually this path or that this is going to be the road. It's not like here's the candy bar you can have when you behave. And so because it's because it's this dangling a carrot, unattainable destination, it becomes this kind of abusive tactic that I can use. You know, I've had sure. people since I left the church, you're destroying your family. Your family won't be together in heaven and all of these other things. And I'm sitting here saying you're threatening some existential future that we cannot know for sure whether or not it exists because I'm not falling in line to what you subscribe as being true. That's kind of what's happening here. God comes down sure. and is like, I am all powerful and you're an ungrateful POS. And he's like, well, you killed my family. You gave me really nasty boils and zits popping all over the place. You took my fields. You took my farms, you took my cattle, 
blah well, blah blah. Let me kind of let me kind of delve into that a little bit too, because the two things kind of go together. So the first one was the relationship between God and Satan, kind of like a, a divorced parent relationship. The second one was the narcissistic narcissistic tendencies that are displayed by God in this story. I want to be clear with that because I don't feel like my relationship with God is based on someone that I perceive as narcissistic. Right. But this story, we have to acknowledge the toxic things there. Right, absolutely. I'm not in any way saying God is narcissistic. Right, and I don't think that you are either. It sounds a little bit like that as we go through the story, and I think it needs to be clear that that's not what's going on. But we have to look at the toxicity that right. is there. Well, and I would say there's a lot of times, depending on, lo- and lots of religions, where that higher power being characteristic is really unhealthy and (laughs) just look at zeus right (laughs) (laughs) well i wasn't gonna go to greek mythology but no in in lots of cases and even in mainstream christianity when we look at some of these stories and and the belief patterns there there are some really unhealthy things going on and i feel personally that if we can say hey this is where the scriptures are limited you know, sure. this is this is where maybe there's some there's issues a lot in we the don't translation know about this story, right? Yeah. And and I'm gonna say that doesn't sound like a higher being that I want to have anything to do with because, right. frankly, the the Jesus of Mormonism, I I just I'm not a big fan of that Jesus, and and I have a hard time wanting to worship that Jesus. Now I know that that Jesus is meaningful for a lot of people. And I want to be able to hold space for that. Sure. But I really want to be able to say, hey, what we've got in the scriptures, archaic, old, yeah, a product of its time and setting, limited. So right. let's let's make sure that we're coming back to what I would call reality-based thinking. And let's look at how maybe we need to shift around that. Because even though nobody outwardly would say, oh, yeah, God and Satan are doing awesome things here. <laughs> this is a message. And when you go to general conference, like Mason, you went to general conference talks and we pulled up a couple and everybody is glorifying Job's humility and patience with God. And nobody's calling out the fact that he's not angry at his abuser. He's not like feeling anything. We're just supposed to sit here and take it and not have an emotional response That's not good for us. All right, so let me take you to the end of this. Actually, let me just go through the first part of the story again, right? So chapter one, bet is made. Job loses everything except for nothing happens to him. Next chapter, chapter two, Satan goes back to God. God says, hey, look, how did you do? And Satan says, you didn't touch him. He didn't care about any of that stuff. And Job says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Isn't that interesting? Like your family is, is his family was gone at this point, right? His yes. livelihood is gone and his family is gone, but that's not against Job as if. It, it, so Satan's argument is he didn't care about any of that stuff. He only cares uh, about himself. So God says, okay, fine. You can touch Job. You just can't kill him. Do whatever you want to him. You just can't kill him. So then Job gets boils. He's miserable. Um, His friends come and sit with him for like seven days and don't say a word according to the story. Creepy. And then they start saying words and they screw it all up. Um, But he goes through all of this time period and there's, there's lots of stuff. But right at the end, Job says the last chapter before God shows up, he says, judge me. Please give me a judgment because I'm not in the wrong here. And then God comes. And what really kills me about this part is God doesn't come and say, oh, my gosh, you did so well. That was rough. That was harder than anything anybody's ever gone through. And um, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. He doesn't say that. He shows up and he says, what do you know? I can do everything. And for one chapter, he basically talks about all the elements that he can control. And for right. the second chapter, he talks about all the animals that he control. And then the third chapter, I forget what it was, more of the same. Um, and then 
Job. So he spends one chapter destroying everything, a couple of verses giving him infected boils, and then like three chapters talking about himself? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, after awesome. I actually have a question, though. After Job spends about 40 chapters, 40 chapters of back and forth between his friends talking about life and justice and all this stuff. Then God shows up. He doesn't clear anything up. He basically says, I'm not really interested in justice. And this is a comment actually that's in that red Bible that you have there that God shows up and basically makes it sound as if justice is not his concern. And that's not the God I grew up with in Mormonism, right? In right. Mormonism, God is nothing if he's not just. And so then he um, um, he makes Job feel so bad that he says, basically, I abhor myself and I repent, and then everything's better, right? Then he gets everything back. All of his animals, he has twice as many. We talked about, you know, family comes back and stuff. Right, but and didn't it say that Job was like, as close to perfect as ever. So what does he have to repent right, of? Right, that's the problem, is the whole story kind of goes through Job, Job is being innocent. stalwart in his testimony, saying, look, I didn't do anything wrong. Right. And it turns out that was correct. But then when God shows up to finally resolve the whole issue, he spends three chapters just berating Job and talking about what his own power and his own greatness. And I... <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that, but it's not healthy. Like you said, it feels narcissistic. It feels very judgmental. It feels like a, like a, more like a bragging parent or a boastful, overbearing boss than it does a loving father who's trying to teach his yeah. son and make him better. So I have a question for you. Um, one thing. I have an answer for you. It I'm sure may you not be the one that you want, but it will be an answer. <laughs> Fair. Okay, so my first question is, remind me of the details of the story. Was this God causing these things, or was it God saying, go ahead, Satan, you do whatever you want with him? So it's God saying Satan can do it. So in the story, God does not cause any of the things that happen. Okay. Um, thank you just for that clarification. Yeah. Cause, that's an important, yeah, that's, important yeah. piece of the story. So my next question is, you got all up in arms, and in my and which I appreciate. I loved your soapbox, just so you know, you have one too. <laughs> Was that um, a soapbox? There, it felt a little soapboxy. It did feel a little soapboxy. Um, that's okay, though. Um, so anyway, one of the questions, though, that I have is, Job no longer exists. He's not alive. This isn't a, like, in my opinion... This is totally a mythical story, kind of like Aesop's Tables. Aesop, am I saying that fables, right? Fables. 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 Aesop's Fables. Thank you. I knew mm -hmm. I got something in there wrong. Aesop's Fables. I'm sure Aesop had tables too. He probably did. Maybe he ate <laughs> off of them. You know, but like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the story about the tortoise and the hare, right. and I know that nobody's racing turtles against rabbits, and right. if they were, no rabbit's going to freaking jump straight in any kind of a race a rabbit's gonna jump more adhd so <laughs> squirrel um but, but because you recognize it's a fable that it's a fable you can learn the lessons without right. having a moral principle founded on it right and so my question for you mason is you're all up in arms and this is toxic and and whatnot but how is this relevant to today like what are you seeing going on within Mormonism today that gets you so angry about this story? Because if we're going to yell at the scriptures, we're in the wrong spot. Um, so I kind of have some of this written down, and it it's comes more after the third piece. And let me just mention that, and then we can come back and talk about it more if we want to. But the third piece that you brought up is that Job is this perfect and upright person but in the story, we're essentially given the message that he can never be good enough. Right. Which I, I think leads to that toxic perfectionism. Right. He's so That anxious. exhaustion Mormonism really pushes endure to the end. Right. Like just take it and just take it and right. just take it and endure to the end. 
And for many people, that turns into scrupulosity or religious OCD. Absolutely. We see a lot of scrupulosity from Joe. Scrupulosity? Scrupulosity, yeah. <laughs> scrupulosity. Um, there you go. Sure. Um, I'll get so tables, so, you get scrupulosity. Like in the first chapter, um, it talks about how his kids had a party. And he didn't even talk to them about what had happened. But he immediately went out the next morning and offered like, seven sacrifices or 10 sacrifices each for one of his kids just in case quote unquote they did something wrong so kind of that scrupulosity thing right like Mm -hmm. well there's i don't want any chance so some of the messaging that you're talking about i think that is part of the answer and why i'm concerned is we constantly get the message that we need to repent every single day yeah Um, you know, don't procrastinate the day of your repentance. There was another one I wrote down here. Let me find it real quick. Um, well, while you're looking, that also goes back to, you know, if Job is sending up all these sacrifices to his kids without even asking them how things went, I think that the story kind of glorifies a lack of connection with your, what Mormonism would call your earthly family, which is so interesting because my experience within Mormonism is that they say the family is the most important entity. Right. But then now that I'm on this other side, it's your family's the most important entity unless your family isn't doing what you want them to do, in which case we're not going to try and understand what is causing these differing behaviors or or whatever we're not going to work to understand them we're just going to call you to repentance and automatically point out that you must be doing something wrong because it's not within the framework that right. we said is right and so i think that there's this story kind of models that yeah do it this yeah. way and keep your blinders on and don't look outside of that at all yeah what's the other so, thing you have written down so well the I, I don't. I didn't find it. I'll, if I find it again here in a little bit, the, the the question that you asked, you know, how does this apply to today? I think is. I think I need to address that now. Um, I just wanted to mention that third thing, but I, I feel like it needs to be addressed right now. Part of what I struggle with is repentance is more important than feeling, and, and I think that's demonstrated in this story. It's all about. Yeah. Repentance or sticking to your guns, like stand ye in holy places and be not moved kind of a thing. Like, I'm here. I know I'm right. I'm not giving anything. I'm not giving any ground. Um, So you're talking about jumping to repentance before allowing somebody the ability to dig in, understand what's going on for them, recognize how it's impacting their life. It's just get them through repentance as quickly as possible and shut down all the uncomfortable stuff. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, and let me kind of share a little bit for myself because I don't do that very often. Um, I'm a pretty happy person. Um, but when I first started seeing a counselor, it was really about... Um, my line of emotion is pretty flat. Like I don't really feel a lot of bad emotion and I know we don't use good or bad. I don't feel a lot of the negative emotions. Um, but I also don't feel a lot of the, um, positive, emotions. The positive emotions, right? My, I had, I have a right. flat line and part of that is because I, I'm I like always to moving monotone. Yeah, I have a I have You're a monotone emotional monotone. level, right? Or you used to be. Right. And and I'm I'm learning, I'm getting better at that, but Absolutely. part of that was because if I always had this mindset, if I can't affect it, there's no reason to worry about it. Um and so if something bad happened, even and and we struggled with this, right? You talked about losing the twins. I didn't have near the same emotional response that you did because I did not connect to them. Because I live in this world where, well, that's not finalized yet. I'm not making that connection because I don't want to hurt right. if it if it's gone. And I feel like there's some of that in this story that Job is not allowed to grieve because he has to state the goodness of God first. Yeah. A- and I just, I feel like there's a lot of unhealthy there. Right. Like, like maybe, and, and there's not more to the story. Like maybe it can be, well, 
God gave, God takes away, and now let me go to my room and just let me cry. <laughs> like, I don't get that impression that that happened, and maybe it did, but that's not part of the story. Right. And so there's no room for us to grieve because we have to be repenting. Right. And I'm an advocate of repenting. Repenting right. is part of the process of growing and becoming better. But if it gets in the way of us feeling, and this is a recent re revelation for me, then I feel like we're losing something important. I think right. that's the big piece there. Well, and what you're talking about is something called spiritual bypassing. In because this is God's will, I'm going to skip this part of grief and just and just get to where God is. And and we do it in lots of different ways. We can and and there's other words, you know, we when we talk about this it's this is kind of a spiritual side of internal and external sources which we're going to be talking about yeah, here so in the give near us a, future. Yeah, so give us just a quick little breakdown of that cuz we're going to spend a lot of right, time on Right. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm just going to do this really brief is that um external sources and internal sources that are informing or influencing our choices. And then we have this little sidebar of spiritual bypassing, which is where we utilize the existential resource or the spiritual resource and say, you know, oh, my husband died. This is in God's hands. Right. And I move forward and I skip the uncomfortable the physiological discomfort yeah. of my grief or you could also see it in you know i moved my family across the country my friend my kids have lost all of their friends this is really hard but i felt inspired that this is where we're going to go so we're just supposed to be here and we all just need to suck it up and yeah. and move on and and what we miss there is sitting down with our children and and grieving the loss of those friendships and the challenges of moving and you know for us as a family because we normally moved with the military so we didn't really have any god saying where we should go because that was the united states government right <laughs> you know, we, we kind of joked about it and passed it off as the army. But when we talk about this higher power that is all knowing, that is, you know, micromanaging the details of my life, when we throw everything back to that external, which is kind of funny because we can't see God. So most people would think that's an internal thing, but really it's the idea and the dogma and the doctrine and the, the religious structure that forms our opinion of what, what God is. And then there's also the experiential side of it sure. too. So I don't really feel like I'm doing due process here, but when we throw it all back to that higher power, we deprive ourselves of the, the in-between part of that in between part of that journey. You know, it's kind of like the, like the little meme of the graveyard. You know, you were born on this date and you died on this date. And the story is really what happens in between the dash, right? The dash yeah. is my life here yeah. and, and whatnot. And, and maybe they should make the dash longer when the dates are further <laughs> apart. And sure. I don't know. Anyway, sure, that'd change our whole perspective. It would totally Absolutely. change our whole perspective. Right. Okay. So, but no, but when you, when you throw everything back to God, and you and you give God all that credit, you, you skip the step that actually leads to healing emotional wounds, yeah. and and that can yeah. be really challenging because it when you skip that healing piece, that's when we're going to start seeing the development of the, that's where the anxiety yeah. and the depression. And when we talk about yeah. scrupulosity or religious OCD, OCD is a presentation of very extreme anxiety. Right. So I love Mason that that's kind of what really stood out to you in this story is that one of the things that you see that parallels the church that you've grown up in and the story of Job is that lack of emotional connection and that lack of allowance for what we would call negative affect or uncomfortable affect. And that's not a polarizing of our emotions. We tend to classify them as these are the ones that are uncomfortable and these are the ones that are comfortable, right. not good or bad. They're not moral. They're just right. describing the physiological response that we get. Those are just the extremes. Like there's lots right. of other emotions that fit somewhere in the middle. And so, yeah. I think the thing that really drove this home for me is that there seems to be this expectation in the church. We talked about this in a previous podcast, but there seems to be, let me protect 
the abuser and a lack of acknowledgement of the difficult things or the bad things somebody has done because, oh, they're such a good person. And I think that we see a lot of that modeled in this story as well. I mean, yes, this is the Old Testament, which is a little wonky. And so the, the God of the Old Testament... I think most people would agree is a little bit wonky, but I think that this is still setting that pattern of God played still hold on to it. games yeah. to prove a point with either yeah. his brother, Satan, if you're Mormon, or his child, Satan, if you're Mormon, and you know, whether it was a parent dynamic or a sibling dynamic, right. playing recreational dynamic, games yeah. for sport and to demonstrate. Yeah. No, he'll still like me the best. God, God is supposed to be the protector, right? right? Satan is our antagonist, and God is the protagonist or the protector in our story, and that is not what happens in this story. Right. God does not come off as the protector at all. Well, and I think that it's important to recognize that when we get in the habit of that spiritual bypassing or that externalizing are outsourcing our accountability because of external resources. That's the other thing is we, we call it outsourcing accountability. Well, I did right. this because my bishop told me or because right. the prophet told me or, right. the scriptures or something. Say right. The scriptures say yeah. so when we outsource that accountability, what we end up doing is we allow for the, the slights or the mistakes that we've made. We, we, we don't give those attention. And for our victims, when there's abuse going on, whether that's overt abuse or inadvertent abuse or covert abuse, we are ignoring the unhealthy pattern that I still have to look to this. Like, you know, yeah. in my life, because my father was the patriarch of the home and therefore the priesthood leader, all of the horrible things that he did when I was a teenager growing up, I'm just supposed to ignore those because, because he's, a good, he's man, a good man. Because he's your father. Because right. He's, he's your my father. Leader. I'm supposed to love him. Right. I'm supposed to all You're of these things. To him. Yeah. All these right. things. And what ends up happening is we, again, we're skipping that acknowledgement that there's something not healthy going yeah. on. And, and so I think that we see both of those dynamics. So one, we're seeing a very unhealthy Bond. I would say that in this story, Job and the Lord are sharing a trauma bond that very much looks to me like an abuser and a victim relationship mm-hmm. going on. And then Mason, I 100% agree with you, this expectation that they're not, Job is not supposed to feel if that means that he's going to have any kind of a... right uncomfortable or quote unquote negative response towards the person who's playing the game with his life. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely some unhealthy expectations here that we are, that we are seeing. So there's one more, there's one more piece of this story that I think is important. And it comes down to the idea that trial and chastening are the same thing. Um, and let me just share one verse here. This comes from the Doctrine and Covenants. It's um, section 101, verses 4 and 5. Therefore they, must needs be, therefore, they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening must, but deny me cannot be sanctified. And the, the problem that I'm struggling with there is that chastening and trials not the same thing, but they're getting bundled in together that we have to endure both. And, and I find that unhealthy because for one, I feel like the, one of the messages in Mormonism and maybe Christianity, I'm not certain is that God doesn't give us trials. Life gives us trials. Satan gives us trials, but God doesn't give us trials. But I feel like In the scriptures, that's not really the case. I feel like God is giving us trials. And in this case, you know, you mentioned it, you asked the question, God specifically didn't do this to him, but he certainly allowed it to happen, which for me is tantamount to the same thing. So just the idea that trials and chastening are the same thing and that we have to deal with them, it feels very unhealthy. I think that that's a really excellent point. One of those things, you know, like I love it when I'm in session with a client and the last five minutes of the session, they drop like the bomb that's supposed to be the meat and potatoes of the entire session. And I'm like, uh, uh, I've got four minutes 
Oh my goodness. I, I feel like you have a brilliant idea at the very end. And so let's make a note and really dig into that at a future episode, okay. because I think that that's a really good point. I also think that there's a lot of back and forth that I've heard in my time at, in Mormonism as to whether or not God gives us trials or God allows us to have those trials. Yeah. Like I've heard it go both ways, but I really like that idea that trials and, and you said chastening chastening, yeah, are, are very different in, in my life. Cause I've heard the same thing in my life. It's always been, well, I guess it doesn't really matter, but when you delve into the specifics of Job, it seems to matter. Yeah. And, and I think that's why that's one of the things I pulled from this is that it seems to matter in this story whether he's getting tried or he's getting chastened because Job ends up, ends up getting both. Right. So to close, this is a hard story. And it, you can come at it from lots of different directions. Right. Is, it, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it just a lesson? Is it a fable? Is it scripture? I, I, mostly I want to point out that we have to view, and I, I've said this once before. We don't have to. We, I'm encouraging you. We need to, if we're going to glean what we can from this, we need to be able to see the toxic. We need to yeah. be able to acknowledge that something is weird or wrong or hurtful or whatever in these stories if we're going to be able to work through that part, because right. that's the underlying message. That's the subliminal message that the theater <laughs> gives us, right? That's the subliminal the popcorn and the yeah, candy. Yeah, that's the subliminal I know, message. I don't know, last at the theater, that was a pretty obvious message in the very <laughs> beginning. They like, were like, go. No, there was the a time room. like back yeah, like I know. 40 years ago where they were doing that. And, yeah, I know. Uh, so I, I want to be able to call attention to this subliminal message because then we can deal right. with it and handle it in a healthy way. Well, and, and I would like to say, you know, call to action for our listeners here. Sometimes life just sucks. Me, Sarah Westbrook, personally, I think this is a story of myth. I think that most of the stories in the Bible are that of, of myth and that we can take the good and leave a whole lot of the bad. But if you are in struggle and you find yourself having a difficult time recognizing or experiencing that emotions, if you tend to shut those emotions down, I'm going to say this is a great opportunity for you to challenge that a little bit. One of my favorite books on this subject, and we've talked about it before, is the book Permission to Feel. That one will be, we'll have that linked in the show notes again for you. Um, I also absolutely love the work by Brene Brown on the power of vulnerability. She has really great insight in in being able to start talking about those things. And if you're, and if you're really stuck and it's really having a negative impact on you or your family, once again, seek the help of a licensed counselor, a life coach, a good friend, somebody who's got your back. Um, because Mason, you know, for you, you had this really awesome experience of being able to see a counselor who really taught you how to sit with those emotional responses better and it's had a very positive impact in your life and so i would encourage our listeners to do the same thing it is healthy to feel and in order to heal we have to be able to really connect with that part of our being um and and life there's there's just so much out there when we know how to experience that emotional side of things. Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is hosted by Sarah and Mason Westbrook. Produced by Alex Vidalis and Daisy Girl Communications. Music by Lorenzo Emanuel. You make your mama really proud. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you. Love you more. Was there anything... Aww.